it gives really great pleasure to introduce Liz Quaglia. She works as a clinical nurse specialist in the new endocrine unit. And some of the most of you that are look after at the Royal Free Hospital knows her. Uh, she's going to give you a talk about the pancreatic and um, molecular tar targeted agency in pan pancreatic nets. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I was asked today to come and talk about molecular targeted agents in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours. The molecular targeted agents that we... Sorry, I'm very quiet. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about molecular targeted agents in neuroendocrine tumours. The agents that we use here and that are used routinely now in neuroendocrine tumours are everolimus and sinitinib. And I'm very conscious that there's several people in the audience that are either on the drugs or have been or just about to be. So you can tell me afterwards what you think. Mm. Yes, I No, it's just these drugs are only used in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours now. It has been, we have had one clinical trial with bronchial, but predominantly they're pancreatic at the moment. We're waiting for the results on the, the lunar study that was in bronchial. I... Right, so today I'm going to talk about the mode of action as in how they work, the evidence behind why we use them, the clinical data in the, is our evidence for these drugs, the side effects that are documented and what we see in practice, and also how we actually use them in practice. So what the ins and outs of how in real practice they tend to be. Um, I'm also going to talk about the patient experience, which I'm probably very unqualified to do, so you might all have to help me. Um, I have recently done a study looking at the patient experience of both these drugs as part of my MSc, so I'm going to tell you about my results that I found as well. So one thing we don't know at the moment in terms of these drugs are when we actually should be using them. At the moment, the ENETS guidelines is that in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours, you use chemotherapy first line. Um, both everolimus and sinitinib are recommended in the treatment of well-differentiated pancreatic tumours that, that are progressing. It, it, because they've not been tested either against each other or against chemotherapy, we don't know whether they could be used first line. It could be, and that's a very interesting question that we're all looking at at the moment. There is a study coming out called the Sector study, which is going to be looking at chemotherapy versus, so f -cyst chemotherapy used versus Everolimus treatment, and then there's a crossover. So hopefully by the end of that study, that will give us some evidence as, A, how, how you should be using Everolimus, whether it could be used first line, or and what difference it makes when you use the drugs in slightly different sequences. So the use of molecular targeted... I came in just at the end of Chrissy's talk, so this follows on quite nicely. So the molecular targeted agents represent the most recent development in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours. There has been an increasing understanding about the molecular under mechanisms within the tumours that help the tumours grow and get their blood supply and their energy. So what has been identified is that the two pathways that are best to target in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours are the VEGF pathway and the mTOR pathway. So just in the most basic way, the VEGF pathway is involved in angiogenesis. So this, is, this means the, how the tumour gets its blood supply. And obviously with the blood supply comes nutrients and oxygen. So if you cut off the blood supply to the tumour ideally, or disrupt that pathway in some way, ideally you cut off the blood supply to the tumour. Sinitinib targets the VEGF pathway. The mTOR pathway is involved in how the cells grow and how the tumours develop once they have grown. And Everolimus targets the mTOR pathway. So we have two drugs that target the cell 
development slightly differently, but this is basically how they work. So th this is just to show you really quite how complex it is. Now, Chrissy probably had far more interesting slides in hers, didn't she? Um, but you can see that in the red circles is the mTOR pathway and the VEGF pathway. So we have excellent... The, the good thing about these drugs is that we have excellent evidence behind them. So when you look at clinical trials, so Chrissy was talking about clinical trials, the best type of clinical trials for evidence, so the gold standard is randomised controlled trials. This is how you get your evidence in practice. And Raymond, so the key paper to do with sinitinib was this Raymond paper. And this was a randomised control, double-blind trial. And what that means is people were randomly allocated to placebo or sinitinib. Um, double-blind means, you may all know this, but I'm sorry if I'm telling people really basic things, but sometimes people don't. Um, double-blind just means we didn't know whether people were receiving placebo and the patient didn't know. So this study had to be ended early because more people died in the placebo arm than in the active treatment arm. So the, the ethical groups had made the study end early. So the favourable difference in progression was that people who were on the placebo arm took... So progression-free survival just means the guys in the, in the placebo arm took 5.5 months to progress and the guys in the, in the active treatment sinitinib arm took 11.4 months to progress. So that's the evidence to do with sinitinib. So the YAO paper is the evidence for Everolimus. The, it's a very, very similar trial in that it was a good number of patients. It was a very similar plan, as in it was a randomly allocated study, placebo versus Everolimus. Again, the people in the Everolimus arm took 11 months to progress and the people in the placebo arm took 4.6. So what, what, this is great because we had excellent evidence for both drugs, but the problem with that is that you then don't know which drug to use first. So what you might notice is that both these studies came out in 2011, so it's very new data but they came out the same year for the same group of patients and there wasn't really any guidance about which drug you use first. What we try and do is use other information about drugs to, to decide how to use them and one of those things that we use is quality of life data and patient experience data but it was there was a very small amount of quality of life information taken in the Raymond paper and none at all in the Everlimus paper. So we weren't able to use that as in, so if one made everyone feel terrible and one made everyone feel great, you'd use the one that made everyone feel great, obviously. But equally, we didn't have that information. So just a review of the side effects. So both the drugs are a once daily tablet. So you take the drug yourself at home and you take it continuously. So there are no breaks in the same way as you, there are when you have chemotherapy or other types of treatment. Um, we do see some hematological toxicity. So changes in the blood counts can be seen, but they're less severe than you see in chemotherapy. With sinitinib, we see some changes in the magnesium, and we also see some changes in the thyroid function. Um, these are normally replaced, so the magnesium is normally low when we see a change in the magnesium, and the thyroid is low, so they get replaced with thyroxine or magnesium supplementation. People report, and the studies reported, a, a level of skin toxicity with this drug. So people see a... Um, a palmer planter syndrome of the hands. So some people can see painful red palms and feet. Uh, and we tend to use emollients as soon as you start these drugs to try and prevent that. People can also see a change in colour for their skin. And it goes a sort of hue of yellow when you're on sinitinib. It doesn't happen with everybody, but it, it can happen. 
there's, there's not anything we can do about that. It doesn't happen to everybody, but some people have found that they didn't like it. From a body image point of view, it's very difficult to change the colour of your skin, and people have noted that they, they thought they looked unwell when they were on this drug, and I think, personally, I think that has come across as quite a difficult thing. Um, some hair changes you see in that the colour of the hair can go lighter and sometimes white. Some patients see a rash. You have to be very careful to warn patients about the rash, otherwise people think that they're allergic to the drug. One of the side effects of this drug that I think is the most difficult is the level of fatigue you can get with it. Fatigue is a very difficult side effect to manage and I think it has the biggest impact on sort of morbidity when you're trying to get through daily life, particularly with these drugs where there's not a break. Stomatitis is seen with sinitinib and it tends to be a globally sore mouth rather than distinct ulcers. So it's, it's normally treated quite successfully with, a, um, with mouthwashes, but there are more more serious treatments that can be used if necessary. We do see hypertension with sinitinib and it's managed in the same way as any other high blood pressure would be managed and some people have needed to take anti-high blood pressure medication. There are some gastrointestinal symptoms, particularly loss of appetite and um, diarrhoea with this medication. We don't see so much nausea um, but it can be a problem. I think in practice we don't see that as much. So Everlema's side effects, <coughs> excuse me, Everlema's side effects are similar. There are some key chip differences though that are important. So it, it again is a once daily tablet. It's taken continuously and it's taken once a day. The haematological toxicities are less. We do see some changes in the platelet counts, but the full blood count is generally not hugely affected or not affected as much as it is in something like chemotherapy treatment. Pneumonitis is the side effect that we all look out for. Anyone that's ever been on this drug, we spend the whole time asking you whether you've got shortness of breath or a cough, and we ask it every time we see you. Um, Pneumonitis can be quite serious, but we try and catch it very early, and it can be treated very easily by just stopping the drug for a short while. I think when, when the trials first came out, we were all very nervous about pneumonitis, but as we get used to using it, and it's like anything else, we're all getting more and more familiar with man managing these drugs, and it's, I think it's helping with, with, with the side effects. Fatigue, again, is a problem. You can get nausea with Everlemus, um, and some people have experienced spots on their face and a rash. One thing I would say is that these, these, these drugs tend to be either very well tolerated or people find them really difficult, and there doesn't seem to be anything in between in practice. So we try very hard to keep on top of the side effects early on. So the reason I wanted to look at the patient experience of using these drugs was because it hadn't really been done and I started to think that something that we're giving you in that is a continuous drug and you ha that has to be so much part of your life, we needed to find out a little bit more about what the experience was to actually receive it. I looked at some quality of life studies. So Renal cell patients, breast cancer patients, and GI stromal tumor patients have been using these drugs for quite a long time. So we can extrapolate, we can take from them their experience. They, they generally, they were, there was also a lack of information really. I looked at lots of different studies and the quality of life was looked at using quality of life questionnaires. But I wasn't sure whether that looked at the in-depth experience of these medications. And so I decided to use this as my project for my MSc, which was nice. So I, I 
did this by carrying out patient interviews and I did that with all, with, all with patients who come to our clinic here at the Royal Free. I'm really very grateful for all, everything that those people did. They came and met with me and we had a long conversation and I was really struck with the experiences they were prepared to share with me and I think what's like Chrissy was saying, we really can't do any of these things without people sharing their experiences with us. So I was, I'm really very grateful. The reason I showed you these, the details of the people that I interviewed is because it reflects very nicely the population of pancreatic neuroendocrine patients. So generally we see a slight male predominance in the, in the population of neuroendocrine people with pancreatic neuroendocrine. And this is a very, this is a good age range to reflect also. So although it was only seven patients, I thought it was a fairly good, good example of them. So I interviewed everyone for about half an hour and I asked everyone similar questions, but they were open interviews in that they went exactly where the patients wanted them to go. I analysed the data by looking at all of the transcripts of the interviews and analyze them using a Colazzi method, which is basically reading and reading and reading and reading and reading the transcripts to try and come up with recurring themes. I also reflected on the experience of interviewing people and at what I thought I was going to find. So my idea was during the interviews I had to clear my mind of what my opinions were, but it was very difficult to do that while I was analysing the data because I think as experienced oncology nurses we sort of have an idea of what we think, what, well I shouldn't say it, what we think you think, which is maybe the wrong thing to say. Um, overall there were four main themes. So everyone I interviewed had had chemotherapy before and nobody that I interviewed had been newly diagnosed. And as, I, as we worked through the interviews, it became really apparent that this was a really important factor and how they were dealing with these drugs. So people said, a number of them said during the interviews, the things that they found difficult about coming for treatment when they were first diagnosed was that they'd just been first diagnosed. So it was the chemotherapy. They all hated the chemotherapy and found these treatments easier. But it was hard to separate out whether that was because they'd just been diagnosed with cancer and the impact of a new diagnosis is huge and it touches everything and I think it helped, it, it meant that they needed more help with those treatments. Also, by the time we treated them with these drugs, um, they already knew where the blood room was, they already knew where to park their car, they already knew, you know, the little things that are so stressful when you come to a hospital, I don't know where the clinic is, I don't know how long it will take, I don't know how I'm going to get to work afterwards. And everyone who took part and are using these drugs know that already. They also know how to get hold of us. So, and they generally know us quite well, so they know we generally call them back when they ring. Um, and those, those kinds of support were already in place. So one, it became very clear that if we were going to use these drugs first line, we have to take that into account and we have to work out a better way of introducing them, I think. That's all done. So the second theme was a bit of a double-edged sword. So every, everybody said, I, I have to admit, I thought that the patients that I saw in the clinic would find, would, would, would get a sense of responsibility about taking the actual pill, going home and taking the pill themselves. And I asked everybody this because I was just interested more than anything. And everyone just said, no, I just take it with all the rest of my pills. It really, really doesn't impact me at all. Until we unpicked that a little bit more, and two of the patients said, well, no, actually, I just tell myself that. And I decide that it's just a pill. So it also seemed to be a, a good coping mechanism for a couple of the people I interviewed, in that, yes, I just take them with everything else, and it's, it's no bother. Um, 
I also was very interested in, in whether they found it a responsibility, whether they would find that a burden in their life. So this is something they're taking every day, and are they going to think all day long, blimey, I've also got to do my own treatment? And everyone said they did find it a responsibility, but they enjoyed that responsibility. It made them feel invested in their treatment. They were in charge. It was them doing it, rather than having to come to the hospital and be given their treatment. Um, everybody said that it was a double-edged sword. It is only a pill, and everyone else thinks it's only a pill too. So when I used to go for my chemotherapy, everyone was coming around making sure I was okay. Everyone was covering my work at work. Everyone was looking after me. And people forget I'm on this. People don't think it's a cancer treatment. People don't really know what it is because it's not chemo and people don't know what chemo, you know, people, everyone knows what chemo is. And chemo is generally terrible. So they found that they get less support with work colleagues, friends and family, that kind of thing. The third theme was that generally it was quite well tolerated. So I, in terms of physical symptoms, everybody said this was easier than chemotherapy. Everybody said that the side effects were okay, but they're, they're manageable. I have to say, I'm looking at a couple of people in the audience who might beg to differ. Um, it's hard also to make a comparison between the two drugs. So I had two people in the study that had been on both drugs. And they, although I wasn't able to use this as a comparison study, they both thought that Everolimus was easier than sinitinib. And... They just, and what, one of the key reason for one of them was that on sinitinib they looked yellow and they thought they looked unwell and when they switched to Everolimus, everyone said how well they looked because they didn't look, have that yellow anymore. So we just, we need to be very careful. One thing I would say is that with these drugs, it's very, very, very important that you get on top of the side effects early. There has been lots of data in terms of low-level side effects. So the reason people say that this, these are well tolerated is because there isn't any. There were very, very few grade three toxicities in terms of so very severe toxicities in these drugs. But I looked at the impact of low-level side effects, and generally it has a huge impact on your morbidity, on your day-to-day -day life. If you're dealing with low-level side effects, because even if it's just grade one or two, we think in the clinic that's not so bad. But if it's every day, grade two nausea, it's not going to be so good. So we really, really need to be on top of the side effects early. The last thing was all about control. Everybody said that these drugs gave them a sense of control. They were able to take it on holiday. They were able to decide where they take it in the day. They were able to use it at work or at home. And generally, people... I think this has a very good link with some of the other themes, and it links very clearly about how we want to look after people. We don't want you to have to come to the hospital very much at all, or at all if you don't want to come. But it's very important that we keep things safe. And we have set up support. I think we see people very frequently at the beginning of these treatments, make sure the side effects are under control, and then the timing gets more and more and more. And it's because I talk to these people that actually we've started to do that. So at the moment, we see people... So everyone that starts these drugs see one of the doctors in the clinic. They then see one of the nurses for tox what we call toxicity checks. And I think it works really well because we have a little bit more time to go into the ins and outs of everyone's symptoms. So we see them unless you're coming for a scan result or there's any particular problem that we need you seen by a doctor. One thing I found very interesting was that I, this was another one of my pre-ideas, I thought the chemotherapy unit was somewhere that people got some kind of support from, 
got some kind of camaraderie from the other patients or just that it felt a sort of safe place to go. And I asked everyone to describe what they can, their experience of being on the chemo suite. Generally, everybody hated it, hated it, and said, I don't want to go to the chemo suite because I thought we could develop this, this pathway of care related, to, similar to a chemo suite where you come, there's people there having the same treatment, we can give information, but uh, I got, I'm not going to do that. Um, Chemo suite basically represented to everybody where they go for their treatment. There's ill people there. You don't want to go there because there's ill people there. And so I, I was very interested by that. We have to be very careful that we... So nobody want, wanted to come. So they all said, right, I would like to come at the beginning and not come again until I have a scan. I want you to give me enough drug and, and never come back. But we need to be very careful that because we do have some patients that struggle a lot with side effects and some people don't ring when they have problems some and you then see them six weeks later and they've fallen apart and their hands are awful and they're feeling terrible so we need to find some balance and whether we can set up we need to think a bit about how we how we set up whether it is skype review or phone calls or more phone calls and less coming but we need to that's that's one thing we haven't quite worked out yet so that, that that's really me finished I, did, I would be very interested if anybody is actually on the drugs they could give me tell me tell me whether I'm talking nonsense or any questions in general Hold it one second. Uh, the one thing I found about sinutinib was that when I was asking whether or not it would actually be as effective as chemotherapy, I was mm. told that it would not actually cure. It was, uh, no. it was more of a, a, um, an attenuator yeah. for tumors. Um, so I didn't really, uh, during the time that I, did, uh, I, I was taking it, I didn't really have a great deal of confidence in mm. the drug, especially since it was, I think, fairly early because I was told that originally sinutinib was used for renal cancers yeah. Yeah. rather than uh, yeah. specifically neuroendocrine tumors. Yeah. It has, yeah, it's been used for several years in renal cell cancer. And I did... Uh, I asked everyone, one of the reasons why a few people wouldn't have wanted it first line was that exactly that reason. They'd had some response from the chemotherapy and they felt that this wouldn't be harsh enough. And that was more of a perception about chemotherapy and how harsh chemotherapy can be perceived to be. But you're right, the, generally you see stability with these drugs rather than regression. But we have seen... We have seen some responses, and we got had another one this week where somebody had a good response. So the stability, but what you would hope is the stability then lasts. So you, you obtain stability, but that is hopefully a long-term stability. Is there any more questions? So um, my mum's about to start, you know. Yeah, yeah. My mum's about to start on this. Um, well, I just wondered, is the yellowness in the skin there because of the liver not functioning properly? No, and that's one thing we have to be very careful because everybody that turns up with the yellow in their skin, we do check everybody's blood, but it's not. It's a right. side effect of the drug. Okay. And it doesn't happen very often. Okay. It's not, it's not a common side effect. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's not really a question, it was just, um, my husband's been on Everly Amos and just to tell you that I think he would agree with all the things that you said. I wasn't going to speak, but because nobody else offered that information. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but he, on behalf um, of Peter. Particularly about the chemo suite, um, yeah. that he actually didn't suffer very much in the way of side effects, but he just found it a really long day and sitting there with people who were ill. Yeah. Um, and although he's been quite poorly on Everly Amos, um, the overall effect, I think, he, he, he does feel that it is just one a day tablet and hey, look at me, I'm not having chemo or anything. So yeah. that's just, you know, agreeing with what, what your study came up with. Thank you very much. If there was anyone here that's on it, I would be very happy to chat to you at the end. It's just a moment about to start, so it's 
Sorry, I keep on going back to the <laughs> lung, but that's what I've got. Yeah. So I was told that that might be my, one of my possible next line of treatments. So is that just, you know, hope for the best because there's been no research done? No, no. It has been used. There is, there, there is promising things with bronchial. We just don't have the concrete evidence yet. So I, I can't answer that, Catherine. <laughs> they, they won't just be treating you with just anything, though. Thanks. Uh, from a slightly different perspective, I went with my wife when she went through breast cancer and chemotherapy, and I found the chemo suite and the nurses, uh, and this was at Northwick Park, was wonderful. They yeah. created an atmosphere, um, and, and people were... Where they had come through the investigations, you met them again mm. because they were going through the chemo at the same time. Yeah. Um, and what I found gobsmacking was when we went to radiotherapy is how many people walk in and out of the doors, particularly at Mount Vernon. So there are a lot of people that have cancer and live with it and don't let it get them down. Yeah. But yeah, there are side effects that make you feel, they sort of slap you in the face and say you're not quite right. Mm. Uh, but I think some chemo suites work really well. Yeah, no, 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 I, I agree. I was just going to say, I've actually been on uh, Everolimus now for about uh, 17 months. Yeah. Um, I also get a monthly Sander statin injection. Um, but I've found, um, it, it, I've improved greatly really on it. I mean, yeah. fortunately perhaps for me, but it, um, the, the secondary metastases I've got in the lungs have, have gradually been reducing quite significantly. Yeah. And, and the primary tumour has remained stable. The other thing I was, I was just going to say is, um, I, I went straight on to that. I didn't have any conventional chemo beforehand. Right. Um, and it certainly seems to be working for me. The other thing I was going to say is the frequency of visits. Actually, because I have the monthly injection, I do go once a month to the hospital. Yep. But actually, because I've got plenty of time and I'm retired, I suppose, I actually quite enjoy that because yep. can, you, know, can, you can have a chat to, to the nurse about how things are, how things have been, and how I'm feeling. And if, if there's any little niggles I've got, yeah. um, you know, she can... Um, you know, yeah. well, so, so, you know, show me that things are okay, actually, and, and, yeah. and it, it's a yeah. sort of a, a pep talk once a month, almost, really, which I, which I think yeah. is, is quite helpful. And, yeah, and lots of people say that. Yeah. I mean, and I do get, I get some side effects, but they're very manage, manageable, yeah. the ones I find yeah. that I've had. I think it seems to be some people sail through this treatment and tolerate it really well. And we've had also, equally, we've got some people who have been on sinitinib 18 months, two years, sailing through it. So it's all of these side effects are potentials. Most people don't get everything of any drug or any side effect that we use. So it's and we see people generally, just to reassure you, we see people regularly until they don't need to be seen anymore. So she can come as often as she wants. You know, it, it really is tailored to how people are feeling. Is there any more questions? But well, let's give Liz like a big applause because Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.